Welcome to The Speechy Show. Being a speech language pathologist often means having too much work and not enough planning time. To beat the overwhelm, we're bringing you the tricks and tools that will make your job a little bit easier. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Speechy Show. I am here today with Rinky from the Dysphagia Grand Rounds website. And we are talking today about being a medical SLP, which is a topic that we haven't really talked about. So thank you for coming on to talk about this today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Good. I'm glad. All right. If you're just joining us, we are talking today about being a medical SLP, things you didn't know about that. And we're going to approach this from the standpoint of that most of my audience is generally school-based or private practice. So maybe some, some people in the audience that aren't really familiar with what a medical SLP does. So Rinky's here to share that with us. If you are new to The Speechy Show, we do this once a week, we, every Monday afternoon. I hop on with a new speech, speech language pathologist and we talk about a topic. We're gonna share five tips with you today and then we're gonna do a giveaway towards the end, a couple of giveaways. So stay tuned for that. And we'll also share some fun resources for you today. So, if you are joining us on Facebook Live today, go ahead and type in which, which kind of setting you are working in. So, are you a school-based SLP? Are you in the medical setting? If so, where are you? We just kind of want to get an idea of who is watching today and what kinds of settings you guys are in. So, type those in the comments of Facebook Live right now. And while they're doing that, Rinky, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Again, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I am Rinki Varandani Desai. So as you mentioned, I'm a medical speech language pathologist born and brought up in Mumbai, India. That's where I completed my undergraduate training in speech pathology. And then I came to the US in 2009. I completed my master's in speech pathology from the University of Texas at Dallas. And I've been here ever since. The rest is history. Wonderful. I've enjoyed every moment of it. <laughs> Now, did you find that there was a lot of difference between studying in India and studying here, or is it pretty consistent across the world? It's really not. I don't know about the other countries, but like just comparing the East and West and India and the US, it's very different because speech pathology is kind of newer in my country, and things are changing a lot, but it's there's a lot of awareness that needs to be done, and I don't know if you're aware, India is the second most populated country in the world. So we have a population of like close to 1.2 billion people, but we only have a couple thousand SLPs in the whole country. That's crazy. So there were just two schools in my whole state. You know, we were 30 students graduating every year. But we were the only people providing these services. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done, a lot of awareness. And I think even the way, um, especially dysphagia and medical SLP is looked at, I don't think people are as aware of our role as they are in the U.S. So sure, I'm hoping sure. That I think they're changing soon. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to be talking specifically today about the medical side of that. Have you been doing that since you graduated with your master's or have you been back and forth? No, I've never worked with kids. I think the last time I worked with kids was back in India in 2007. <laughs> so nice. I wouldn't know what to do with a child in a school. <laughs> See, and I wouldn't have any clue what to do with a swallow patient. So, <laughs> yeah. we're... so basically, I think just for a decade now. Yeah. Two years in the U.S. and then I work for two years in India. So perfect. All right. So we have one person chiming in that she is a school-based SLP. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, go ahead and type in which setting you are working in currently. We want to know where everybody is. We're going to go ahead and get started though with our five tips. So we're going to share today five things that you didn't know about being a medical SLP. And the first thing we're going to talk about are the types of disorders and patient populations that you would work with as a medical SLP. So, Rinky, go ahead and tell us what kinds of uh, what kinds of things we might be encountering in this niche. So, um, for those listening, if you're a school-based SLP or even the general public community, even though our title says speech language pathologist, speech and language are kind of the least of what you'll be doing as a medical SLP. So, the two big areas are cognition, which is your thinking skills. Um, and swallowing. So swallowing disorders are called dysphagia. That's kind of primarily what you'll cover depending on what setting you're in. Um, there are people who work across the lifespan. So we have medical SLPs working in neonatal um, ICUs. You have people working with adolescents, but most likely you'll be working with adults in the geriatric population in different settings. And some of the common diagnosis or disorders you'll be working with are stroke, dementia, Parkinson's, head and neck cancer, 
lots of tricks and vents if you're in a more acute type of setting. Um, and if you're working with infants, it'll primarily be feeding disorders or maybe developmental disabilities and the cognitive and language disorders that come with that. Was that a lot of information? <laughs> that's, really helpful. Okay. that's all right. That's good. So, um, so if you missed any of that, where our sound kind of cut out a couple of times. If you missed any of that, she's talking about how you're going to be seeing lots of swallowing and cognition, not so much of the speech and language that we do a lot of in the schools. So it is a very different feel. I know when I was doing my medical internship, I, I felt like all I did all day long was just swallow study after swallow study after swallow study, and that was it. But I was in a very acute care setting, so that, that tended to be what we had. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so you're going to have a different kind of disorder set that you're going to be working with, a different population. Um, there's also just very different work settings. So tell us what the work setting looks like for a medical SLP. Yeah, I want to make sure, is the voice coming okay? Do you think the sound is fine now? Yeah, yeah, it's coming through now. I think, like I said, I don't want to say there's no speech and language. So depending on the work setting, if you're in something called inpatient rehab, where basically the patients are more higher level, they can tolerate rehabilitation for three hours a day, they might be coming in with acute strokes. So you will be doing a lot of speech and language therapy, um, also known as aphasia. If they have a language disorder called aphasia, you'll kind of be doing that with them. If they have apraxia, which is a motor speech disorder, you will be doing your traditional speech therapy with them. But that's if you're an inpatient rehab. Mm -hmm. So I did my CFY in something called an LTAC, which is a long-term acute care setting. Um, it's an extended ICU. Patients are critically ill. They have tricks and vents. So it was more of cognition and swallowing for me in acute care and um, long-term acute care. First is if you're working in a nursing home, uh, for those of you who are not in the U.S., a SNF is a skilled nursing facility. If you're working with these more older geriatric patients, you'll be doing a lot of cognition, memory, attention, you know, cognitive skill building, um, and again, a lot of dysphagia. So these are a couple of the common settings, but you also could be working with an ENT in an outpatient clinic you could be doing home health as a medical SLP, and some people go into academic and university settings. So the scope of practice even within medical SLP kind of differs depending on where you're working. Sure, that's very much like working with the, the pediatric population as well. Mm -hmm. We see that there's all kinds of different things you may be dealing with depending on what your location is. So our, our field is just very, very broad, isn't it? I know, and I think people don't know that, especially the most common thing when you walk in to evaluate someone's swallowing, you'll say, hi, I'm Rinky, I'm your speech language pathologist, I'm, I'm here to evaluate your swallowing. And you'll be like, honey, Why? You, my speech is just fine. Why are you here? And now I just say I'm the swallowing therapist, but the, you know, it just invites less questions. I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, I get that question a lot too when I when I'm telling people like, oh, you know, we talk about these kinds of things in my field, and they're like, swallowing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of our scope. <laughs> or even cognition or using an AAC board. Like I think people yeah. traditionally think speech is like correcting a list or rolling the R's or stuttering, uh -huh. which is part of what we do, but it's right. not everything that we do. Exactly. Exactly. All right, so we've talked about the different disorders you might see and the different settings that you might be working in. Um, let's talk about medical SLPs and technology. What's important to know for technology-wise if you're looking into the medical SLP part of our field? Yeah, so basically if you're in a grad school which gave you hands-on training, you're very lucky because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so you're going to come out and you're going to be told you're the swallowing specialist and you have to start watching people's insides <laughs> and basically seeing if they can swallow okay. So you're either watch, um, doing a FEES, which is fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, where you go in through the nose and you're watching the vocal cords and making sure um, the patient's swallowing okay and if everything's functioning the way it should be. Or you're doing something called a VFSS, a video fluoroscopic swallowing study, uh, also called a modified barium swallow study, where basically it's like a moving x-ray where you give the patient different things to eat and make sure they're swallowing okay, if not, what the possible causes for that might be, and so on and so forth. So lots of fees, lots of MBS. You need to do a lot of training after grad school to be able to do all of that. Uh, we're starting to do manometry and SEMG for biofeedback in dysphagia therapy now. And if you work in a voice clinic, which I don't because I'm not really good with voice disorders, <laughs> you might be doing stroboscopy as well. So just be prepared to see the insides of your patients quite a bit. 
<laughs> I love it. Okay, so uh, first of all, if anyone has any questions on Facebook Live, go ahead and, and type those in the comments. We will take those as we go along. Yeah, please jump in and ask whatever you need to. Yes, we don't know what you don't know. <laughs> yes. So, okay, so my question then is, let's say, okay, I'm a school-based SLP and I'm thinking, holy goodness, I haven't done a modified barium swallow in seven years. I wouldn't have a clue where to start. Is there a way you can kind of train up on this technology before you get the job or is this kind of a, you just get the job and trust that you're going to be able to learn the technology once you get there? I think these days people won't really hire you unless maybe it's a rural area with a desperate need. I don't think you'll be hired if you don't have the experience, but I don't want them want that to scare people because coming out of grad school, I didn't have that experience either. Mm -hmm. So I think the two ways of doing it is either you find someone to shadow in your area and maybe go on the weekends or spend some extra time watching swallow studies if that hospital has a HIPAA rule where they won't allow observers, you can do the MBS IMP training or Northern Speech Services. So it's almost like a certification or like a course which walks you through all the different components of an MBS. Um, and you said that was yeah, from Northern okay. Speech Services? Yeah, and maybe I'll give you a link to that so yeah. you can include it. Yeah, if you could go into the Facebook yeah. Live after we're done and just add that in the comments, and then people will yeah. be able to see that link there. So that's a, a course or on MBS. SpeechPathology.com, MedBridge, they have a lot of continuing education courses. So I would definitely say at least do that and yeah. really know how the muscles are working, how they contribute to your swallow function before applying for a job in a setting like this. Absolutely. I second SpeechPathology.com. They have some really good... Um, continuing education courses on there and I'm sure they would have some stuff on that as well so perfect yeah. all right so we have covered disorders we have covered work settings we've te covered technology if you are watching with us on Facebook live right now stay tuned we are going to be doing some giveaways in just a few minutes and sharing some good resources for the medical SLP world so stay tuned but right now we're going to talk about interprofessional collaboration now I know what that looks like in the school setting because I am always working with the OT and the behavior therapist and all of this. But what is what do these relationships look like in the medical setting? Who are we collaborating with? So yeah, like I, like you know, in the school setting, you're working with social work and OTs and teachers. I think in the medical setting, it would make sense that you're working with other medical professionals. And I had asked one of my friends once, why do you not want to work in a medical setting? And why do you choose the school setting? And one of the reasons she had given me was because she felt intimidated, like maybe talking to these different medical professionals and, you know, uh, discussing patient care with them because we don't have a complete education that trains us to learn how these different systems interact with speech or swallowing. Um, I would say the, the most surprising thing I learned is they consider us to be the experts. So the pulmonologist, the neurologist, they want to know what you think of the patient's speech and swallow function. What are your um, suggestions for their prognosis and recovery? And they look at us as the experts just as we look at them as an expert in what they do. So you will be collaborating depending on the setting you're in um, with pulmonologists, neurologists, your internal medicine MDs, critical care specialists. Um, if you're in a nursing home, lots of nursing staff. But just consider yourself as the only person who can give them this education and training because you're the expert to provide it. So I think it's a great place to be in. Absolutely. One thing I was going to add to that is if you're feeling uncomfortable, you know, talking to these kinds of other medical professionals, I think doing that shadowing like you were talking about before mm -hmm. can be really helpful because you can talk to that other speech language pathologist and say, okay, how do you collaborate with them? What does that look like? Or what information do yeah. they need to know or do you need to know? to make it a successful relationship. And that, that brought to mind um, Autumn Bryant's site. Is it Expand Your Scope? Does that sound right? Expand your scope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go to expandyourscope.com, she's got a cool program set up where you can shadow, you can find someone to shadow in the job that you're looking for. So uh, definitely yeah, check that out. Groups. You know, we have the mm -hmm. medical SLP forum. Send yeah. a message out. Everyone's always willing to help. So just say, hey, I'm in this area. Is there anyone who could maybe just even talk me through how they work this out. You know, we started a regional support team for Western New York. So we meet once a month and just kind of bounce ideas off, see what issues we're having in long-term care settings. There are so many ways to collaborate now with social media and the internet. I think if there's no excuse for not being confident and confident in what you do, because there are so many resources we can use. Yes, just, just reach Please out. Website. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a question here coming out of grad school. Whoops, it went by. Autumn's on. Fabulous. Hi, Autumn. <laughs> All 
All right, Jody says, coming out of grad school, I had little to no experience with dysphagia, along with shadowing and speechpathology.com. NSS has some cool dysphagia CEUs. Perfect. So she, she agrees uh, about finding those resources. And Autumn is on. She just shared the link to her site, expandyourscope.com, awesome. uh, for CCC SLPs who want to shadow and mentor each other. So that's a great resource for all of you to be able to um, access that. Just scroll down in the comments, and you'll see Autumn's comment there. Um, Okay, T Tamara is asking, what's the best way to find someone in Florida? So I would say go on to expandyourscope.com, try that. You can also try searching for Facebook groups of medical SLPs in your area, or you said that you have one, um, is that one of the ones? Yeah, we have a link to that. It's a medical SLP forum, yeah. So you there's can a- just join it. We have over 20,000 members now, so I'm sure there'll be somebody in Florida. So just put a post, and I'm sure somebody will be willing to help. Perfect. Uh, and will you put the link to that in the, the Facebook yep. section or comment section too? Perfect. So we'll have, whoops, we will have the, uh, the link for that group as well. It is called Medical SLP Forum. All right. We have one more tip to go and then we're going to move into the, the resources and the giveaways. So the last part is challenges. What are some of the challenges we're going to face, whoops, as a medical SLP? I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but I think for me, something I'm still struggling with is kind of balancing, and I'm sure it's the same for school SLPs, balancing that emotion and the empathy component with just being this practical, logical clinician, um, trying to be the best clinician you can be. Just because I think most of us got into the field wanting to help people and serve, um, and we're different from MDs. We're not just walking in and out. We're not just rounding for 10 minutes. We're working mm -hmm. with a lot of these people for an hour every day with their families for weeks or months. So obviously you're an integral part of the recovery of their life. You know, if they're not eating and you're getting them to eat again, if they've had a stroke, their life has changed overnight and you're getting them to learn how to speak again or write again. These are really important uh, events in their life and you're there for all of it. So it's hard not to get emotionally attached and carry some of that baggage home, especially when someone dies. So as a medical SLP, you will see some death, if not a lot of it. So I think, being able to keep that away from what you do and focus on the positive that's something i'm still kind of learning every day absolutely yeah, yeah. i can say i've only had gosh I, it may be just one that uh, one of my students that that passed away and it, it was hard it was very hard yeah. and I, i've always thought i don't know that i could do you know working in like uh like with a terminally ill because i just don't know that i could emotionally exactly. handle that so i would i could definitely see that you would need some some coping mechanisms in place of how you can, you know, be able to process that and work through it and understand that you are offering services that are making their lives better, even if it's just for the short time that they, they have left with us. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. Autumn is sharing another tip for us. She says ASHA Profine can be used to find SLPs in your area too, if you don't mind cold calling. Perfect. All right, Liz says, I'm a current grad student and I want to get into the mes medical SLP field. What advice can you give me? So what would you say are good things to be doing while you're still in grad school to kind of prep you for that, that path? You said it was Liz, right? Yes. Hi, Liz. <laughs> I was the same way. I came from India and they were trying to put me in all these different school-based rotations. And I put my hat foot down and I was like, look, I know I don't want to work with kids. I know I want to work as a medical SLP. Please give me the adult like medical rotations. Every school may not do that, but I think if you know at the onset that's what you want, ask for rotations in that area. Try to take as many electives as you can that covers the wide scope of what we do. So electives in trachs and bands, electives in aphasia, advanced dysphagia, anything your school offers, ask your academic advisors and try to do that. Um, and, you know, try to do some of these CEUs. You may not get credit for it, but you can still go onto these websites and say you've done the MBS IMP or say you've done LSPT for Parkinson's, you can do a lot of these courses and have those skills before you graduate so it's easier to get a CFY or a placement in a medical setting. Perfect, and I was thinking shadowing too or um, volunteering yeah. in a medical setting if there's some ways that you can kind of get some more hands-on. And yeah. I know also when you were saying taking electives, our school also had a nursing program and it was in the same building, um, which was convenient. But we were able, we had the ability to take classes like medical terminology, where they go over like all the Latin roots of all the medical yeah. words. That would have been huge if you were going into that field. So exactly. look outside your field, you know, your, your curriculum as well and see what other programs in your school might have some offerings that would kind of carry over. Yeah, and usually your academic advisors will be your best friend. Like if they know what you want, 
don't kind of depend on them to, you know, um, de develop your curriculum for you. If you tell them what you really want, they'll look for courses and offer you stuff you can take that you maybe didn't even know existed. So I would say try that first. Absolutely. Perfect. All right, Liz says thank you. Let's see, we got some more questions coming in. Um, <laughs> Tamara says that's the mistake that she made and got stuck in the schools and it's hard to get back into it. I agree. I feel like when I was in grad school, I was like, yeah. okay, I could go either path. But now that I've done schools, I'm like, I don't think I could do medical SLP to save my life. It's the same for me. <laughs> like if I have kids, you know, maybe I don't want to work every day, like the kind of hours I'm working. I don't want to be on call on Saturdays or whatever. Maybe I want my summers off. I think it would take a lot of training for me to get into a school setting. So I, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it, it happens, but there's ways, you know, you can, you can do more training. You can, if you really want to break yeah. free, you can. <laughs> All and right. PRN is always, especially in the U.S., you can always find PRN jobs. If you have some um, education and competency, you can kind of get your foot in the door by doing PRN on the weekends mm -hmm. at a hospital yeah. and then working your full-time job if that's something you really want and then eventually Absolutely. transitioning to full-time. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, let's see. It says Autumn says that Chow Seminars has lots of dys dysphagia-related CEUs and gives you access to Anatomy TV, where you can study models of the anatomy that you can rotate. Well, that's cool. Look at that. We got all kinds of resources for everyone today. <laughs> like, exactly. If, if only you look, honestly, you have everything at your fingertips today. Like, you just have to take the effort to put in the time and build your skill set, I think. Yes, absolutely. All right, Genevieve says, I graduated from a medical SLP program geared towards adults. I just finished my CF in a school for children with disabilities. Whew. Are there opportunities to transition into working with adults? Uh-oh, it cut off. I don't know why it does this, but it won't let me read the whole comment. Um, nope, it's not going to let me do it. Uh, so if she's looking to transition. I'm not sure what the rest of your question was, Genevieve. If you've got more to it, go ahead and type it in the rest of it again. Do you again. think she meant adults with disabilities or... Um, maybe. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Autumn says, would you recommend PRN in a hospital or a SNF to get started with transitioning? Is one preferable to the other? What do you think? I don't think so. I think personally for me, it was easier to start in a hospital just because you're seeing change a little bit more faster. Mm -hmm. In a nursing home, it's a lot of dementia and people are really recovering if at all they're recovering, it's very slow. So it can be a little discouraging, mm -hmm. but then but then hospitals are a little bit more challenging where you really have to know your stuff. You have to know your stuff either way, yeah. but I, I don't think you can afford to make the kind of mistakes you maybe can in a SNF um, in a hospital. So I just think if you're comfortable with your skill set and knowledge, you've done the work, I would start in a hospital. Okay, there we go. Let's see. Uh, Jody says, Dr. Eric Blicker's courses are affordable and great too, and he does the FEE, the F-E-E-S. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. perfect. I took his course. He's great, actually. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Okay, so Genevieve's wanting to know how to transition to adults in general. So that's a lot of what we've been talking about today. If you missed any of the first part, Genevieve, the recording will be on the, the Facebook page, so you can watch the whole thing. Uh, but generally just, you know, getting in and, and shadowing and doing some extra training to try to figure out what you're interested in and what maybe information you still need and what training you still need. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add to that on uh, transitioning to adults from pediatrics? No, I think that covers most of it. But if you're looking to wing it or, you know, like they say, fake it till you make it, <laughs> I, I don't think that's something you should be thinking you'll be able to do as a PRN because often you're covering for people who are not there, you know, Monday to Friday. So maybe you're the only person there on a Saturday. So they're not looking for someone who's looking to learn. Like, yeah, I would make sure you at least have a very basic understanding of dysphagia, or the, the anatomy and physiology, um, what you're looking for in an MBS or when you read a fees report. I would make sure you know all of that before you get into PRN because they're not going to have the patience or maybe the manpower to like really train you to do all of that. Absolutely. I agree. That sounds spot on. Okay, perfect. That was a ton of questions. If you guys have any more, keep them coming, awesome. but we're going to we're going to move on and do some resources and giveaways. So, what are your favorite resources for medical SLPs? We already talked about the Facebook group, which is Medical SLP Forum, and we'll have a link to that. Um, what other what other resources you got for them? We discussed Northern Speech Services, medbridge.com and speechpathology.com. Those are my three 
favorite like continuing education courses mm -hmm. they're all pretty much in the madbridge and speech pathology.com are like hundred dollars a year unlimited access to courses and northern speech sells them um by each course mm -hmm. depending on what you want and we have a course up there called the aging swallow it's a three-part course for the medical slp if that's something you're interested in um a cup three of us together developed an a mobile app it's for 15 dollars it's called dysphagia therapy it's pretty much for anyone who's transitioning into dysphagia and kind of wants this tool in the, in their hand so it's really neat because it has everything you need to go through an assessment all the treatment techniques with evidence for why they work and don't work Ooh. and they have this really cool feature where you basically punch in or like you check all the impairments you're seeing and then it it has an algorithm where it matches what therapy technique would be best for your patient what? and why you should use it. <laughs> so uh, I would definitely download the app. It also, you can export patient handouts. You can do a lot of stuff with it and it's $15. So that's something you can look at. Um, okay, hang on. Let me, courses. hang on yeah. just a sec. Let me repeat that so people get that. So that is the dysphagia therapy, dysphagia, sorry, dysphagia <laughs> therapy <laughs> app. And <laughs> Autumn says she loves it. <laughs> she just chimed in. And that's the one that she was just saying you can, uh, you know, check through what you're seeing and it'll pair you with some good therapy techniques, which sounds awesome, yeah. among other things. Okay. It's on the Tactus Therapy website. And they have other amazing apps for cognition and language as well. So I use them a lot in inpatient rehab and now in long-term care. So I'll put a link to that. And if people are interested in using apps, I think that would be a good web website to go to. Absolutely. That's the Tactus Therapy apps. Okay. Uh, and then what's the last one you got resource-wise? Dysphagia Grand Rounds. So we just started that. with. I started that with Dr. Yanasa Humbert. She's the director of the Swallowing Lab at University of Florida. So basically, we were really concerned about people not using evidence-based practices in dysphagia, and that kind of reflects on the whole profession um, in general because we're now the swallowing experts, and we're the only people providing dysphagia therapy. So we give out a free article um, that clinicians can read every month. So it's like an online journal club. And then Dr. Humbert presents a webinar at the end of the month that walks you through the research design, the strengths and weaknesses of the paper, um, how we can use that information and apply it to our practice. And then we have a conversation about the clinical implications. So we've covered like the free water protocol, the use of EMSD, the use of vital stim. We kind of discuss these different things in a fun way and try to make research a little bit more palatable. So <laughs> that's kind of what we do every month. And, you know, you can join in anytime because the webinars are recorded. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. And that is actually what our giveaway is going to be today. So... Uh, the, I'm going to ask a question here on Facebook Live. The first person to answer the question correctly is going to get one of the webinars free through the... Anyone that they want. Yep. Anyone. So you get to pick which webinar you want. Um, Autumn's sticking in some awesome links to Rinky stuff. Thank you, Autumn. And then the second person to answer I the question... <laughs> she's on it. <laughs> the second person to answer the question today is going to get two free months in my membership, which is the Speech Therapy Solution. And we are doing a continuing ed. We just got approved to start CEUs in September. You can also ask us questions and you can download uh, worksheets and printables and all kinds of great stuff from that. So the second person to answer today is going to get two free months in my membership. So we're going to do that right now. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> all right. So the question is, name a disorder that a medical SLP may work with. The first two people to type in medical slp disorders are going to be our winners today and there's a bit of a delay so we have to wait for them to come in someone's probably like i sent it i sent it why this isn't is it coming exciting. up <laughs> just have to be patient autumn thank you so much for adding those links too okay genevieve genevieve flex says aphasia and alma mira partida says tbi excellent you guys are our winners awesome. so Genevieve is going to win the webinar. How do you want her to contact you? You can email dysphagiagrandrounds at gmail.com. Okay, dysphagiagrandrounds at gmail.com. And then, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you can also go to www.dysphagiagrandrounds.com. You Perfect. can see which webinar you like, and or I can just email her a list of the webinars, and she can pick whichever one she wants. Perfect. Congratulations. Yay. All right, and Alma, you are getting the two free months in my membership. Congratulations. 
So you can go, you can email me at Carrie at speechandlanguagekids.com. That's C-A-R-R-I-E at speechandlanguagekids.com. And we will get you all set up. Perfect. Okay, so that's what we have for you today. That was a ton oh, of information. Um, Rinky, why don't you go ahead and tell people where they can find more about you? Yeah, um, I have a Facebook professional page. It's Rinky Medical Speech Language Pathologist or a website, rinkyslp.com. Rinky is R-I-N-K-I in case anyone's confused. <laughs> um, there's more information on the Dysphagia Grand Rounds website and you can email me anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions. Perfect. And we'll put those links in the show notes as well as in the Facebook comments. And if you'd like to learn more about the speech therapy solution where you can get support and CEUs and resources and worksheets, head on over to speechandlanguagekids.com slash join. And don't forget to uh, hit us next week on the Speechy Show next Monday afternoon. I can't remember what we're talking about, so it'll be a surprise. <laughs> but just watch the Facebook page. You can follow us and you'll get notifications when we're we're coming up with something new. So thank you, Rinky, so much. This was wonderful, and I appreciate thank having you. you on. All right. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. All right, and thank all of you for being here. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us today on The Speechy Show. We hope today's tips have helped you feel a little less stressed and a little more confident about your work. If you're looking for more stress busters and confidence boosters, we'd love to have you join us in The Speech Therapy Solution, where you'll get access to a huge library of premium training videos and another library of print-and-go therapy materials. You can also get help with your tough cases by joining Carrie on the weekly Q&A calls or by posting in the exclusive Facebook group. Plus, group members can join us for a monthly webinar that can be used for continuing education credit. Head on over to speechandlanguagekids.com slash join to check out all the amazing benefits of the Speech Therapy Solution membership. Bye for now.